Welcome everyone. To, this is the 21st SF Doc Fest. I'm Gigi Haycock, one of the programmers at the festival. You all watched The Last Guide, and we are fortunate to have with us the director Christian Gomes, producers Aiden Chiatau, and Karem Banka. And thank you all so much for being here and talking to us about your film. I'm, I loved it, obviously. Uh, very much. And um, I guess to start off with Frank, I mean, he's such an unforgettable person and I feel like his face says it all. <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. like one of the most amazing faces uh, I've ever seen. So um, just tell us a little bit about how you came across Frank and how this whole thing came about, please. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll start us off here. Thank you so much for having us this year. Uh, it's an honor to be programmed. Um, so we, we met Frank quite a number of years ago. Um, there was a book written about him by the same title called The Last Guide. Um, and I had read it sort of like tucked away in like the Canadiana section of a bookstore. Um, it was really popular like in the 90s and then kind of tailored off from there. Um, and as soon as I read it, what I was reading was just like this, this crazy visual, um, just like engrossing story about the life of, of like this fishing guy who seemed to embody basically all these myths of like, of Canadiana essentially. And I was like, wow, it would be so interesting to, to get to meet him. Um, and then I learned he was still guiding. Um, he was still in Algonquin Park, which is only about in, uh, you know, a couple hours north of Toronto. So it's very accessible. And that's why the park is, is, is so um, famous, at least in the area. It's because of, of its proximity to Toronto. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I went up there. He was, you know, he, he was very willing and uh, he just loved being on camera. Um, and <laughs> as soon as, as we met, like it, it was like the, the words that I read in the book were right there in front of me. Like he was just so electric and just like a, a perfect documentary subject. Yeah. And when did you all end up meeting him? Um, you guys, did you all meet him? So you met him first Christian and then kind of brought everybody onto the project? Yeah, or? exactly. So, so I, I had met him first. Um, it actually started off um, as a, as a student film for me, um, kind of my, thesis film in the last year of, of film school where we all went to film school together um and so yeah closer to the end of that I I had uh, introduced them to Frank I brought them over to meet Frank when um I knew that the film could sort of um take a new shape and, and expand from that student film into a larger film um and that was because I had learned that Frank um was getting sick and mm -hmm. he wanted to sort of start passing on his knowledge to somebody and he was looking for somebody to pass it on to. Um, and at that point I thought, you know, it would be great to get Aiden to come and, and Prem to come. Um, we have like a, a very tight uh, group um, and we make, we make films really like just us three, maybe a few other people. We keep it really small for documentary. Um, and so, yeah, I, I brought them up to meet him. And then maybe you guys can talk about your first impression of Frank. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I've had like different roles throughout the process of making this. Like in film school, I was the editor. And then I was one of the DPs on, on the longer format shoot. So I, I felt like I met him uh, through the editing process in film school because I was just like sitting with his interview and all this footage of him. Um, and then when we met him out in, uh, I guess that was in sometime in uh, September or, or of uh, 2020, um, that was our first time like meeting him in person. And um, like Christian said, he's immediately like the guy you think he is. Um, mm -hmm. he, he kind of just wears his life story on his sleeve. That's something that Karim talked about a lot is just like Frank is always telling his story to the camera. Um, and so, yeah, it was immediately like he's there's this kind of like magic pixie dust that just orbits him. And uh, that was kind of our goal was really to just let him tell his story. Um, 
So yeah. Yeah, Frank, uh, Frank is just like, as I think evidenced by seeing him in the film, he's, he's like one of those rare documentary subjects, I think, who is like extremely quotable. So like I <laughs> saw the doc, the short form doc a few years ago, I knew it was being made uh, with Christian and Aiden involved as well as a couple of other people from uh, York University. Uh, Andy Yoon, who's also one of the DPs. And um, I was just like, I can't get this guy out of my mind. And so when I heard that there was a, Christian was planning on expanding it, I was like, I definitely want to be involved. And then, yeah, that first day actually meeting him, it was kind of a weird, like, magic fantasy world. It was just there, uh, his house, he had all of his stuff gathered around him. You know, he's like wearing his fishing clothes and he just like looks like a, a character from, from a movie. Like just when you show up, even without a camera pointed at him. So yeah, it was a really unique experience. Yeah, he seemed to have such an incredible philosophy about how he went about his, his uh, craft, basically, you know. Um, it was very physical. For a man also his age, I know he'd been doing it much longer than that, but, uh, and uh, being able to stash his canoes around and everybody knew who he was. And mm -hmm. obviously it, that was just incredible that he has that ability to um, be so in touch with the land and know the, the, the water so well, you know? Um, so it, tell me a little bit how he, I mean, he said he was eight years old, right? When he started to do this and he made more money than his dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's cracking me up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so he, he did, you know, he started when he was very young. Um, the landscape of Algonquin Park shifted a lot over the decades um, that he lived there. Um, so it, it essentially got developed into a national park. Um, you know, he lived there before it was really a huge national park. Um, he was born essentially when the highway finished to reach that national park. Um, and then it kind of grew around him. So really in, in every sense of it, he, he was a part of that area. Um, like he, you know, he discovered the lakes as they were written and on the maps and, and really he, he was a part of it. Um, and so he, he just knew everything about it. And because he discovered at such a young age that he could make good money, um, you know, guiding Americans around the park and showing them where the fish were. Um, it's just what he took up. It's just what he did. Like he said, he made more money than his dad did. Um, and then he just, he just kept on with it. Um, at the time, obviously, like it was hard labor in the park. Like it was a big logging area. Um, and that was like the main thing in the park, logging. Um, so it was like, he, you know, you could choose between logging or fishing all day, which is, which I'm sure for him at the time was a, a really easy choice to make. Um, and then, yeah, you know, as, as he, he um, matured and as he, his name grew in the park and he became known as, as the guide to go to, um, he just sort of made this like crazy legacy in the park. Um, there were other guides as well. Um, and there were other famous guides too, like Tom Thompson, who is a, a really famous Canadian painter. Um, he was also a guide in the park for a little bit. Uh, but the difference was no guides stuck it through their entire lives, really. Um, and then also Frank was the youngest because he started when he was eight. So he was able to outlive all the, the other guides who started around the 40s. So he was really, you know, he was the OG, right? And uh, yeah. you know, he was he was in the park guiding when like they would they would drop resources for the for the guides out of planes so that they could keep trekking through the park and 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 marking things and and making trails. Um, so yeah, pretty pretty crazy. Um, and if only we could be there in the forties, we would have documented that too. <laughs> how how did he decide which lake he wanted his wife's name? To be, to be named after her. I mean, because it was sounded like it was quite remote. Uh, Aiden, do you wanna talk about this? Yeah, sure. I mean, so that lake, uh, Lake Marie, which is not officially named still, uh, is very deep in the bush. Like it's not accessible to a common person. 
And he would go out there with his wife, I guess that he found that tra trail out there. He really made his own trail out there and would take his wife out there. And she loved it. She loved to sit there and like watch him fish on the lake. And they would camp overnight at that lake together. Um, so they, they, it clearly was a, a place where they, they bonded quite deeply. Um, and so, I mean, that was in the movie, we trekked out there and, you know, the day prior, Charlene was telling us, okay, it's going to be one kilometer hike out there. And we had like big cameras and audio gear and, and all that. And then, and then I was like, okay, well, it's maybe like a three kilometer hike. And then by the time we actually went and did it, it was, it was actually 10 kilometers there and back. Uh, so it was very deep, deep in, in the bush, um, hidden away. You wouldn't be able to find it, um, on your own. It's, it's not really even very visible on a map. Um, so I think that that was just like this kind of sanctuary for Frank and his wife, Marie. Um, and, uh, that's where they would spend a lot of time. Do you think it'll ever be named after her? Do you get a feeling that that'll happen? That they'll go for it or? We, we hope so. They, they, they were trying for a long time, like his family now and his estate is still trying to do that. Um, I mean, the, so the, the, the real kind of reason they they won't name it is because there's a lot of other lakes in the um the same like geographic kind of like township um that also are called marie lake um yeah. and you have to understand like in algonquin park there are thousands of lakes like there are so many lakes you couldn't eat, like you couldn't see them in an entire lifetime um so there are apparently one or two other ones named marie lake um so that's why they don't want to name it. So the family is trying to figure out a way where they can maybe have the lake um, be named in a way that honors Frank and Marie together. Um, so possibly like a like a Kuyak Lake or, or something like that. I don't really know what they're discussing, but um, they're still trying to do that. Uh, it hasn't yet been added to the map. Okay. Yeah. And um, so speaking of family, though. Charlene's story is quite interesting of her carrying on the teachings of Frank. Uh, I know it says a little bit in there that it's unsure of what her future is gonna be with it, but it seemed to be that she's moving in the, the, in the path of his, um, that he, you know, he was doing, that's what he did. Yeah, I think, um... I think Charlene's journey is, is, is difficult. It's not really straightforward. Um, and I hope that kind of comes across in the film because she's not 100% sure what she wants to do with the, the things that Frank has taught her. And that's only because it, it's like his shoes are so hard to fill. Um, I don't think she has any illusions that she's ever going to be a guide like Frank. Um, but I think at the same time, she does want to make sure that the experiences that she had with Frank and how she learned from Frank and the knowledge that she got from him, um, you know, is passed along to other people in a similar fashion. And I feel like that's, that's a good way to honor his legacy. I mean, I think Frank himself probably would have just loved if someone like put on his hat and like got in his canoe and just like kept it going. He was very like literal in that sense where he wanted to find sort of a successor like that. Um, but life doesn't always happen the way we want it to. And I think Frank knew that too. And I think he was really happy with the way that Charlene was sort of, um, was taking it up. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, sorry. I, I think that there were, there are other guides, you know, in Algonquin Park who are sort of, more of this like new wave of, of guide who don't quite, you know, operate and use the exact same tools and methods and everything that guides, guides like Frank uh, used. And so with Charlene, um, I think it was about carrying on his philosophies and his stories. And she's definitely done that. She was crucial with us finishing this documentary, especially um, losing Frank partway through filming and not really getting everything that we wanted with him. Charlene was like totally crucial in just helping relay some of those last days where I think we kind of wanted to give the family and him some privacy. And um, yeah, and she, she just, she really loved him a lot and their bond is yeah really special. And I think that is kind of the real takeaway because um, there's, 
the industry has changed of guiding. You know, it's it's not really no one do ranked anymore. Change so much. Uh, so can you repeat that? Him on and, and, can you, you repeat know. that last thing you said? You just you lagged out there. Um, the, the industry has changed so much. Uh, yeah. and I think that no one really can exactly, you know, replace Frank and do it the way he did it exactly, uh, how de dedicated he was and everything to it. Yeah. So she's carrying him on in his philosophies and his lessons and his stories. And, uh, she was crucial to the documentary in that way as well. Yeah. I love how you all shot um, well, his voiceover was fantastic, right? Because of his, just his voice is as good as his face and everything. It's like a, <laughs> but, yeah, it's like a, a narrator, yeah. Right, it's another character in the 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 film. And just, uh, but there were just quiet moments, I think. And I appreciated watching that because it's watching him do what he does, you know? And uh, it really kind of solidified, I don't know, made it, solidified it to me of exactly what I was feeling. So uh, that was beautiful. Big credit to Krim there because he was our editor on the project. And uh, I know I know he was uh, he was balancing all the time, you know, his narrative and his like, he's such a powerful and like attention demanding voice um, that it is kind of like, you do need a break. You do need to just like watch him, you know, do his thing <laughs> as well. Yeah, and also to um, to Andy Yoon, who he he was the cinematographer on like the film school short, and that informed a lot of the approach that we took into filming the rest of it. And and also Kyle McDougall, who who shot like the opening and closing of the movie. Um, there there's these moments that that both of them captured um, that then inform helped inform our shooting approach with with Frank, where you have these like elongated portraits of, of Frank or these moments where you're just kind of observing him and his mannerisms and him and his environment. I mean, when we met him, like when, when Karim and I met him, it was literally him sitting outside of his house, like in a dark shadow, um, reading, reading a book. Uh, and it was like, whoa, we've just stepped into a storybook. Like this is, and this is our, our protagonist. Um, so yeah, big credit to those guys as well. Yeah. Oh, great. Oh, I just loved it. And um, do you have it going on anywhere else that uh, after doing SF Doc Fest? Um, so no other fest lined up right now, but there will be a broadcast, um, but that's going to be in Canada. Um, so the, the national broadcaster here, CBC, will be um, playing it a few times um, nationally. So that will happen in the next couple of months. But uh, it's it's to be seen. We're waiting on on other festivals, so fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, well, it's fantastic, you guys. I appreciate it and 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 all the work that you did on it and bringing Frank to people who didn't know him. And I hadn't read the book. Was that the one by Ron Corbett that you? Yeah, exactly. That, that so yeah, if 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 you'd like to read a lot more about Frank, because there is tons of material out there about him, definitely find the book, The Last Guide by Ron Corbett. Um, and he also wrote a sequel to that book called The Last Guide's Guide, which is uh, kind of Frank's like philosophy to life. And it's, it's, it's way more philosophical and uh, it's, it's a great read as well. Um, but other than that, like a quick Google search, you'll find everything. <laughs> There's so much. <laughs> you need yeah. to know. All right. Well, thank you all so much for your time. And I really appreciate it. And um, I can't wait people to see this film. Thank you so much thank for you. having us. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. All right, guys. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye.